Welcome, everyone. If you can just uh, get a seat if you're still standing. Welcome to the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design and the public lecture by John Patkow. My name is Scott Francisco, and I'm the co-founder of Wood at Work. This lecture is uh, the final component of a two-day event that's uh, culminating right now um, called Wood at Work. And we have, uh, under the Wood at Work banner, brought together uh, architects, engineers, foresters, industry folks, people thinking about wood in new ways and looking back to the history of wood and forests and the immense importance of forests in our world today. And as architects, we have a very special responsibility to work with wood and think about wood and where it comes from and how we use it. So it's been a great day. We've toured buildings. We've had um, over 25 different uh, short talks and conversations. So it's just a, really a perfect way to end, that, uh, to end that event to hear from John. Pad cow. Um, it also is very fitting to read the University of Toronto acknowledgement about the in indigenous lands um, that I'm going to read. We'd like to acknowledge this sacred land on which the Univers University of Toronto operates. It has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Patun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources of, around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home of many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community um, in this, on this territory. So that's especially meaningful for the event that we've had and the idea of meeting and collaborating and, and looking back and, and thinking about how indigenous um, knowledge and culture can inform what we do today. Um, this event has been a collaboration from so many people, so I'm just gonna give a, a very broad thank you to all that have participated so far, to our sponsors that included uh, the faculty, the John H. Daniels faculty here, and others, the forestry, faculty of forestry, the Carpenters Union, uh, Woodworks Ontario, EACOM, AECOM, sorry, EACOM, um, and, uh, and others, Forest Ontario, uh, Structure Fusion, and Radiant City Millwork. Some of you will recognize that name. Um, I'm a proud graduate of the college here, of the College of Architecture, um, before it moved to this building. So it's a real thrill to have been part of this event and also um, to welcome John Patkow, who has been an inspiration to me um, since the time I was a student here. And I had the great opportunity, just as I graduated, to do an interview with John. Um, it was my first foray into writing, in, in, uh, architectural writing. So I have incredible, um, uh, good, incredibly good um, influence from John. And I'm going to ask um, one of my former professors, Bridget Shim, who has been, um, as most everyone in this room knows, uh, an incredible part of this institution to come up and formally welcome John Patco. So, Bridget. Okay, can everyone hear at the back? Good. Uh, so I'm very pleased that the fourth Wood at Work conference is being held at the Daniels faculty at the University of Toronto. I was fortunate to be invited to participate in the very first Wood at Work conference in New York four years ago. <clears throat> and this is a really important event because it links the design community, the forestry community, and industry together to make lateral connections that help reshape our understanding of wood as a renewable resource and this bigger question of community building. I'm thrilled that John Patkow agreed to be one of our keynote speakers, ensuring that this conference is linked to design excellence. And John, along with his partner and collaborator, Patricia Patkow, and their amazing Vancouver studio team are really a remarkable force in the field of architecture. John <coughs> and Pat founded their firm in 1978 
was about the time that uh, Howard and I started architecture school. And since then, they have continually raised the bar and set really high standards necessary to build a culture of architecture in Canada. They've addressed a very wide range of building types and scales, which is really unusual. You have people that do little things, people that do big things, but very few firms cross over and always address multiple scales, and I think that's amazing. The Pat Cow Architects have won just about every award around. The list of accomplishments is very long, very impressive, and easily accessible. So I didn't really want to repeat all of that. I wanted to introduce John by really sharing some of my own personal observations about the enormous impact of their work and the importance of their contribution to architecture in Canada and beyond. <clears throat> they approach each project, large or small, with an enormous level of integrity, commitment, talent, determination uh, that is really inspiring. In a way, um, the, the whole idea of a house for John and Pat is really not a kind of building type, but really just a vehicle to explore powerful ideas about architecture. I think about <clears throat> on one of their earliest projects, the Pritch House, 1983 <clears throat> in Victoria, BC. And it made you think about a kind of, the fact that it was really about a courtyard and the house just happened to frame a rock in the middle of the courtyard. Uh, <clears throat> I was fortunate to visit the Porter Vandenbosch renovation in High Park in the mid 90s. And it was the first time that I had really seen a project in Toronto where there was a clear dialectic between new and existing. This kind of um, very sort of subtle and sophisticated play of what was found and what was added didn't exist in the city at that time. So the clarity, the precision, and the eloquence of this renovation still resonates with me. When you think of a whole range of houses, the Barnes House, the Shaw House, the Augusta House, the Linear House, the Tula House, are really all intense essays into site, program, and the integration of fusing building and site together. In a way, this body of work is clearly a position about architecture. And in a way, you think of that, that could be just a whole practice in itself. So in addition, they have actually done a series of libraries, museums, university buildings that are really the kind of cultural institutions that shape our nation. So this kind of, the fact that this dual scale is operating at the same time is really so impressive. Uh, you know, starting with the Clay and Glass Museum in 1988, where they're looking at circulation, light, section, and how they all work together. The Grand Bibliothèque in Montreal, which really is an impressive piece of city building, an underground subway that links into the library's civic spaces, a singular building that takes up almost a whole city block and in effect reshapes our understanding of learning. And then recent projects such as the Polygon Gallery, the Audain Museum, and then our local Fort York National Visitor Center continue to push the boundaries and explore new ideas about rethinking and redefining architecture. So I just have to say that John and Pat's work is uncompromising at every scale and that they create architecture that really matters. And I think globally, Canadian architecture is almost invisible, very under-recognized, <clears throat> and John and Pat have been remarkable ambassadors and the exception in always presenting the best and most sophisticated design in Canada to the rest of the world. Their ongoing preoccupation with light and space and structure is really in, embedded in everything they do. As architects and educators, they really think of their studio as a laboratory. And often things in their studio start off small, they get bigger, and that the kind of love of experimenting and maybe not knowing whether the results will be positive or negative, that kind of risk taking is actually a really important dimension. I would say they've always reveled and delighted in taking very ordinary materials and through experimentation, turning them into extraordinary pieces of their architecture. So in a way, I would say their work continually sparks our imagination about creating built form of many scales that allows us to see new ways of shaping space 
and city building at the same time. So we're really pleased that John Patkow is here with us tonight at the Daniels faculty in the University of Toronto and as a keynote speaker of the fourth Wood at Work conference. So maybe John can come up. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Well, thank you very much, Bridget. That was a very generous introduction. I appreciate that. I'd also like to say that I, I've been quite amazed at this conference that I was fortunate to be invited to. It's been a, uh, an experience that I haven't previously had to be part of a multidisciplinary uh, discussion surrounding uh, a subject like wood. And uh, I really believe that uh, I've learned a lot and uh, will take this away as a, as a lesson that uh, even at uh, an advanced age, you can still learn things. Um, and speaking of age, I'm, what I, when I began to uh, think about what I might say at a conference about wood, obviously wood is a central building material, especially in British Columbia. Uh, and we've had a long experience with wood. And so I decided what I would do is I would sort of uh, review uh, that long history using this material uh, starting 30 years ago. Um, let me just get that. Starting 30 years ago with the Seabird Island School. And, uh, and what I would like to do, I'm going to move through uh, a number of projects, uh, and I, some of them I will describe as projects, and some of them I'll just have some observations or some anecdotes. Uh, I would like to say, though, that uh, I've uh, titled the lecture work at, uh, Wood at Work and Play because uh, we have used wood uh, in uh, two types of projects or two kinds of ways of looking at different projects. Uh, projects that are conventional architectural commissions and architectural competitions but also projects which we have initiated uh, for ourselves as uh, explorations, as research projects. Uh, and that's, the implication is that's the difference between the work and the play, although it's not clear to me that there is that real difference. And I think in some ways, uh, work and play are not different. They really are uh, an ambiguous, uh, couple, uh, and things that start out as work often end up as play, and similarly, sometimes play start, ends up as work. Um, and so uh, I think that what I would like to suggest, and uh, which is something that um, Bridget implied as well, is that uh, uh, if you bring curiosity and discipline and rigor and uh, energy uh, and passion, to work, uh, it be can become play, and if you bring that to play, it also can become serious. Uh, and so with that sort of general structure in mind, I'm, I'm just gonna move chronologically through a number of projects. And the first project here is the um, Seabird Island School from 1988. Uh, and it's uh, my first, Pat and my first uh, interaction with uh, an indigenous community. Uh, this is for the uh, Seabird Island Band, which is a coastal Salish band uh, about uh, two hours east of uh, Vancouver in the Fraser Valley. And you can see the island, Seabird Island, uh, in the midst of the surrounding mountains. And uh, there were many uh, interesting... Um, we, uh, we were very young. This was uh, really uh, our first significant uh, scale uh, building project, uh, and, and so uh, there were, there's much uh, not to look at closely, but there are some things that are interesting about this, and, and uh, one of the things that we began with was a, 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 a inter interactive uh, consultative process with uh, members of the band, uh, the teachers as well, uh, and as part of that, we decided to visit a number of schools in the Fraser Valley that were near uh, Seward Island. 
And these were schools for the general public, and they were conventional schools at the time, as they would be in, in BC. And uh, after visiting the schools to try and understand what characteristics were, might be appropriate for the, uh, for the band school and what wouldn't be, uh, we ended up uh, in a, in having an interesting discussion because um, we observed that the members of the band were actually not very happy about being in these schools. And uh, they were, to describe them, they were double-loaded corridors, uh, concrete masonry unit, painted walls. Uh, the roof was a flat, uh, open web steel joist with acoustic tile ceilings. And that was the, the norm for schools in uh, ele elementary and, and secondary schools in British Columbia. And we tried to understand why, I mean, it was obvious to us why you wouldn't be happy there, but it wasn't obvious why our clients weren't happy there. And so we came to understand that really what it was, uh, was that the, both the material language, but also the organization and geometric order of those buildings were resonant of the residential ex school experience that many of the members of our uh, client group uh, had experienced, and that there were really powerful negative associations with that language of architecture. Uh, and so, uh, although we had always intended to be uh, constructing a building using materials such as wood and cedar shingle cladding, uh, the geometry of the building uh, was transformed on the basis of that experience. And as a consequence, we developed a form, which you can see, uh, which uh, has I don't know how to describe it. Uh, is it organic? Is it biomorphic? Is it, uh, I don't know what the proper description would be. What it really was an attempt on our part to make a building that would be ambiguous in its character that would allow members of the community to see things there on an individual basis so that as it transpired, some people saw the building as a mountain form, and some people saw the building as a bird form, and some people saw the building as a fish form, and uh, all of those are good, and all of those are right. And, uh, and so uh, uh, that was the beginning of trying to find a way of communicating and doing something that was meaningful uh, for that community. At the same time, um, we um, uh, had uh, an, an unusual opportunity because the school, which was uh, funded by uh, the federal government, was intended as well uh, as a function of the um, ambition of the project manager, who is an architect in, Van in Vancouver, uh, Marie Odile Marceau, who uh, actually sponsored a number of schools before she was forced out of the uh, federal bureaucracy uh, that uh, were ambitious in character. And this school was intended to be a project which would be a skills training opportunity for members of the band. And in that sense, the uh, wood structure, as opposed to, say, concrete masonry or steel frame or some other um, uh, building system uh, proved to be very uh, appropriate. Uh, uh, it allowed the members of the band to uh, construct the building uh, uh, themselves, but it also implied the fact that we had to detail the building in a, an appropriate way. And so, and you should understand that this building was designed and constructed uh, in the late 80s. There were no computers in our offices. Uh, the geometry of this building was worked out on a slide rule. Uh, the drawings were hand drawings on paper. Uh, and so uh, the, even though it, there is a, a complex ge geometry to this building, there is a, actually a very simple repetitive system which is uh, uh, largely two-dimensional, which is simply adjusted from bay to bay, which generates the more complex form. 
Um, but there are some, some, but in order to make it uh, achievable, it had to be big, bold, and what we called uh, using chainsaw detailing. Uh, and I'm not being, that's not a joke, that's literally the case. I mean, uh, you, that's one of the construction tools that are, are used uh, on this type of a structure in British Columbia. And in fact, uh, there are a few areas within the building that are where uh, the two-dimensional frames are actually turning corners and becoming uh, complex. And those joints, uh, which is another virtue of the wood construction, were unable to be described by us on paper adequately. And what was done was that uh, the members were brought together in space, the physical members, which were over long, uh, and suspended with uh, shoring and, and cables. And then the geometry of their intersection was actually mapped out in physical form, and the connector was templated in plywood, sent to the steel fabricator, fabricated in steel and returned, and then the members were fit to this, uh, this uh, uh, mocked up uh, connection. All of this very rough and ready. And uh, in order for the, us, <coughs> this, is the part, this is part of our working drawing set. Uh, we were actually paid by uh, the client to build this model to send to the construction site because the two-dimensional drawings were quite removed from the three-dimensional reality. And so the band, when they couldn't really understand the drawings, would go over to the model. Now, the model was constructed by a first-year University of Calgary architecture student, which is to say it was a very good student model, but it was not a construction document. The band, when they didn't know what to do, took the case off the top of the model took their measuring tapes and started measuring the members at 1 16th inch scale and uh, making their cuts on site. Uh, totally scary proposition, which I fortunately did not know about until after the building was finished. And it was told to me then. Another interesting dimension to this project was it was obviously at the time extremely um, complex geometrically, uh, well beyond the skills of most uh, uh, builders, in, uh, which is interesting, but also beyond the skills of most cost estimators. And so when we were costing this project, the project was constantly being estimated as being 50% over budget, et cetera. So there were two things that, that uh, solved that problem for us. The first was that Macmillan Bladell, which was a former major lumber company based in Vancouver, had in, developed a new product called Paralam uh, stru uh, wood structures, wood, wood members. And they said to us that if we used Paralam for the engineered wood components of the building, they would guarantee the structural cost would meet the budget. And so we said, great, and we did that. Uh, the interesting lesson is, shortly thereafter, uh, Macmillan Bladell was purchased by Weyerhaeuser from the U.S. Uh, their, all their research, including the people who put Paralam together, was closed and moved to the U.S. And in a sense, that was the end of uh, real innovation in the British Columbia timber industry for several decades. And that's only this new resurgence in mass timber has been uh, a wave of new energy in BC, as it has been in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, and so there has been that hiatus of about 20 years when uh, Canadian uh, lumber practices were actually dormant, uh, and we were simply pumping out studs for uh, US uh, house construction. So those are all sort of interesting experiences for uh, virtually the first project that you do as a, as a young architect. A um, couple years later, we were commissioned to uh, design a library in a suburb of Vancouver in Surrey, uh, and our ability to deal with architecture uh, was marginally better at that point, and we began to be a little bit more uh, 
explicit uh, about the identity of uh, various elements within the building assembly. And unlike the school, which uh, I've only shown you images of from the exterior because we were unable to uh, take the tectonic character of the exterior through uh, into the interior, here in the uh, Newton Library, we were able to bring that language consistently throughout, and as well to uh, deal with things that we previously hadn't been able to deal with, such as uh, daylighting and um, the collection of rainwater. And so each of our projects was a slow learning uh, uh, curve. We really, because we'd started the, the practice as very young people, we really had no uh, apprenticeship in architectural practice. In those days, uh, you didn't require, uh, I didn't write any exams to become registered. I simply had to be, uh, uh, have had been employed for uh, two years uh, and I was registered. Uh, and so I, we had very little experience uh, and really had learned on the job. And so every project was a huge step and learning curve. The next project is uh, again, uh, only a couple years later, it's a house uh, called the Barnes House in Nanaimo uh, on Vancouver Island. And this was an, uh, what, what we learned on this project had to do with the difference between stud frame construction and heavy timber construction. And so um, the house is a wood framed house and you can go back and see this. And I, I, I only understood this after the fact because a friend of ours from England who had seen the photograph said, uh, he mentioned that concrete house that you designed on Vancouver Island, and I said, what concrete house? And he said, well, this house. And well, it's not a concrete house, it's actually a stucco-clad, uh, uh, wood-framed, uh, stud-framed house. And I realized uh, when that mistake was made uh, that um, there's a, a fundamental difference in the way we use stud-frame construction from the way we use heavy timber construction. Stud-frame construction is monolithic. It's made of little sticks, and the sticks have to act together, and they become, uh, they're, they're welded together by the sheathing and the drywall on the interior, and so you get the walls uh, of the house, which are the stud frame components, reading as concrete, or they could be mass uh, uh, brick uh, that have been rendered. They could be any material that is made of bits uh, that uh, become uh, uh, a continuity, whereas the heavy timber roof is elemental. You can see each of the components that go to make up that roof. And so there's a, a beginning of an understanding of the nuances of different kinds of wood construction and the roles that they can play uh, in uh, architectural development. The next project, again, it's, uh, this is only four years after the um, the first project, the Seabird Island School, it's a school for the Victoria Public School Board, an elementary school called Strawberry Vale School. And for us, this uh, project was a transformative uh, project in our understanding of uh, nature. Uh, we uh, had always been thinking about what makes vernacular buildings so durable and so appropriate um, and had been in many ways attempting to understand how to accomplish that in a building that's designed, uh, in a building that's constructed in today's world. Um, and so this, we began thinking about this and we began thinking about all of the environmental systems which a building needs to respond to. So a building that would be shaped by the forces of nature. Uh, and also uh, the selection of materials as appropriate in terms of the impact of construction on nature. And uh, in thinking this through, uh, collecting rainwater and dealing with uh, the hydrology of the site and, and things of that nature, in doing that we, for the first time, understood the landscape, not as landscape in the sense, in an aesthetic sense, uh, but as an environmental system, as, as, an, as, as really nature. Uh, and I think that's partly because of the, uh, uh, that line of thinking was 
facilitated by our being in British Columbia and being living in, in a very wild site. Our, our home is in a, in a very wild site and working in the kind of context that you see here, which um, is, is in the suburbs of Victoria, but still has a very strong uh, natural, uh, natural character. And so um, for us, it, it really was the um, awakening of an understanding of the environmental dimensions of architectural and design, the environmental impact of architectural design, and the beginning of thinking of environmental systems rather than aesthetic systems. And so the building, even though it's very uh, carefully designed and, and detailed, uh, the understandings are, the materials have been selected because of their uh, appropriateness in terms of uh, material sourcing and uh, use. And so um, the, uh, the building is largely uh, framed out of uh, dimensional lumber, uh, nothing larger than a, than a, a two by 12. And when you get into larger sizes, we go to steel. Um, and where the, the interior of the building is largely just the structure, largely unclad, just allowing the structure to be, but where the kids come into contact with it, we have refined millwork, or we, where we get into the classrooms, which you'll see in a moment, we begin to bring claddings in uh, in order to increase the luminosity of the interior. So it really stripped down, carefully designed systems, uh, carefully designed uh, light coming in, and then the addition of uh, uh, other materials such as millwork and drywall to be reflective of light and to create luminosity uh, in the interiors. All the materials are being selected much more for their perform, or as much for their performative uh, characteristics as for their uh, visual characteristics. And then taking that medium-sized building uh, and using the same language at a, a domestic scale, this is a house uh, uh, on San Juan Island in Washington State. Uh, it's in a meadow uh, on a hill uh, and designed to act as a, almost an agricultural ele uh, element in the landscape that simply runs across the site as opposed to being on the site. And it too uh, uses uh, uh, conventional uh, wood frame with the occasional use of steel structural members where required, but in this case, it clad in metal because of the fear of uh, f grass fires and forest fires. Uh, and so again, the interior is uh, very much in the manner of the school where a drywall and millwork is brought in where people uh, were needed for either luminosity or, uh, or touch, but the uh, raw construction of the, of the structure is allowed to uh, remain uh, where uh, possible. And then uh, uh, after a jump in time, uh, a project that uh, was serendipitous. I remember that when we were doing this project, I was actually uh, kind of uh, feeling very low energy and uh, my uh, desire to sort of really push the limits on this project uh, were not as strong as they should have been, uh, and we were rescued by an amazing consultant team. Uh, and that's one thing I need to mention is that uh, we've always worked with tremendously gifted uh, engineers. The early, uh, there's a, uh, in, uh, sort of the, the godfather of uh, the great engineers we currently have in Vancouver, C.Y. Lowe was the uh, engineer for the first projects, and then we moved into Fast and Ep, and uh, then a graduate of C.Y.'s office, uh, C.C. Yao, uh, and uh, now Equilibrium Engineering. So all of those firms are just phenomenal engineers. In this case, uh, Fast and Ep, and, uh, and uh, what now has become Integral Engineering, and uh, we, uh, we did a number of things which were um, a first for us uh, in, on this project. Uh, this project was largely prefabricated. 
some of it was uh, prefabricated off-site and some of it was prefabricated on-site. Uh, and uh, um, so I'll just describe that the roof structure was made, each of those elements is a unit. And this is, so uh, Jerry Epp, who now runs StructureCraft, the company that does most of the uh, mass timber construction for Michael Green and, and on those, all those buildings, uh, was our structural engineer, and he was working with the notion of prefabrication. And so we developed this roof structure where you had the glue lambs, and then these panels were simply pre-made and dropped on site with a crane. And the other dimension of it was uh, we had an, uh, a European engineer at, uh, uh, which at the company now called Integral by the name of Vladimir Mikler, and he was a proponent of uh, radiant uh, heating and cooling, and uh, which was adopted in this building. And this building is actually the first building in North America to be radiantly heated and cooled. And what we did was we cr constructed double wide tilt-up concrete walls, uh, which so there's a structural uh, wide, there's insulation, and then there's an interior non-structural wide. And in that interior non-structural wide uh, radiant uh, tubing. So the walls and the structure of this building are the mechanical system. Uh, and so uh, uh, the building had to have a number of characteristics like large overhangs to avoid uh, sudden changes of uh, solar load. So the interior was well shaded. Um, but uh, uh, it's possible to open the building up completely in the wintertime and still retain the environmental performance of the building uh, because of the large amount of concrete radiating uh, within the interior of the building. So again, uh, the, the, the collaboration, in this case, the engineers really brought the game forward rather than the, uh, the architects, which was an interesting experience. A house that I'm going to just mention very briefly. It's a wood-framed house. You can't tell that. It's clad in uh, fiber cement panels. But it has some really interesting uh, things about it. So this is the exterior. And it has, um, uh, this is wood-framed. This is an 80-foot sp clear span uh, carrying massive uh, glazed, uh, operable glazed walls, which are, op are retracted in this case. Um, uh, and uh, that structure is a pair of six by 12 glue lambs spanning 80 feet. Uh, and that's, they're held together by a plywood diaphragm. And uh, that, was, that was done because it was on an island which, in which uh, wood frame construction was much more accessible than uh, other kinds of construction. But it, it, again, it demonstrates the uh, power of, uh, of uh, wood construction uh, where you can get um, this kind of a clear span uh, with, with two 6 by 12 glue lamps. Uh, the other thing that this project is important to us for is uh, uh, the beginning of an unconventional use of materials. So the interior of this house is clad in polycarbonate, translucent polycarbonate panels. So this is a a greenhouse cladding system. And we put 40 skylights on the roof of this house, which don't shine into the interior directly. What they do is they, sh they shine into the roof assembly. And so this skylight is separated by this polycarbonate layer. And when it's shining, you see these spots of light on the ceiling and in the interior that are intended to allude to the character of being under the fir trees outside. And at night, uh, the lights uh, that light the general interior are located in, the, in there as well. And so we, it really was the beginning of trying to think about materials in unconventional ways to get architectural results that were unconventional. And this moves fairly quickly into a line of research projects which I'm going to describe the, the wood ones from. But before there, I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, a competition which we entered and won in 2010 for cottages at Falling Water in Pennsylvania. And uh, this is an image of our competition proposal. 
Uh, you probably all know the site, but um, this is uh, the area. It's the Laurel Highlands of uh, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, it's an area of rolling uh, 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 low, mountain, low hills, mountains. I guess if you're from the east, if you're, if you're from the east, there are mountains. If you're from the west, there are hills. Um, the, um, it's, it's very, very picturesque and very beautiful. Uh, our site uh, is located up just above the Frank Lloyd Wright. This is Falling Water right here, and this is our site in the meadow up above Falling Water. And uh, we took uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's strategy uh, uh, of uh, us utilizing landscape form uh, to create architectural form. And so here, this is the site of uh, the famous uh, Falling Water House before there was the house. And you can notice when you see the house how the rock shelves are repeated in the cantilevers and how the character of the house really is an intensification of the character of the site. And on the meadow that we were located on, which is in this uh, photograph, we decided to do exactly the same thing. Uh, and this is a, a perspective of our proposal. And our proposal was to locate uh, six cottages uh, in uh, steel culverts, uh, highway engineering culverts that would be covered with soil uh, and would uh, uh, therefore be very cost-effective structure. Uh, and they would all uh, be uh, open to the south to gain some solar energy. And so here you have a site section looking back uh, at the cottages, uh, which are buried in the meadow itself. And the plan, which is a very simple one bedroom unit with uh, living room, dining room, kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom, uh, which uh, is constructed within a conventional uh, highway style uh, steel culvert. Uh, which has been carved into uh, to create apertures. And so this is the bedroom, and this is the entry uh, passage, and this is the living room, and this is the interior of the living room. And what is interesting about this is, in order to find a way to finish this, we began thinking about wood and plywood. And the idea was that we would take very thin plywood and simply attach it to strapping that was attached to the inside of the steel culverts. Uh, and that would generate the uh, geometry of the, and the character of the interior. Well, unfortunately, this project was never realized. But uh, the uh, initial thinking about using plywood uh, to create these kinds of forms uh, became uh, the, a step uh, in uh, a whole series of projects, which I'll sh which are sort of arrayed here. We've, and these are, this is not up to date. There are some new ones that are, go off the page here. But these projects are um, what we call material operations. And they are uh, explorations into the use of materials where uh, some material, a sheet of plywood, a sheet of steel, um, some fabric, some material is selected and a force is applied to the material to deform it to create a structural form and a spatial form. And so that's the simple principle of material operations. And the first project in that series is called the Winnipeg Skating Shelters. And it's a, just a temporary structure on the Red River in Winnipeg. Uh, we, this was uh, very early, and now there's been a whole series of additional iterations of this competition in Winnipeg. And I know Toronto has a similar kind of uh, uh, annual event now. And the idea here was to find a way to take simple materials to deform it and to create a structure and a space. And so this is a, this is a, I think this comes off of a apple pear uh, in a market and you stick a, a, a stick or, a, or a, a through it, a skewer through it and uh, it takes on form and structure and space. Or uh, part of a plastic cup and you put an elastic band around it, oop, you put an elastic band around it and it becomes a structure or a spatial element. And so thinking about plywood, we thought, well, if we're going to do something that would be temporary, light, and able to 
be installed out on uh, the frozen river, we would look at plywood. And we began by looking at trying to mock up uh, what we were doing using wood veneer. And this is an example of one of the studies that we were making uh, at very small scale in wood veneer. And we thought, well, that's, uh, that has some possi uh, po uh, possibilities. And it has some positive characteristics in that it's very light, very thin, uh, minimum use of material to enclose space. It has a ridge along the top, which is going to shed the snow. Uh, and it might even move around in the wind, and, uh, and, uh, and that will help in moving the snow away as well. And so we, but we quickly realized that working in model form was not going to work. We really need to be working in full scale. And we have a shop in our office where we can make things. And so we got some very thin plywood, and we began to try and make this. And we were completely devastated that we, this was just uh, really not what we were hoping to achieve. And we realized that the plywood itself was not doing what the wood veneer was doing. Uh, and after some thinking about it, we came to understand that there was a really fundamental difference between plywood and wood veneer in that plywood is an isotropic material. It has similar strength on both axes by virtue of the layered and contrary uh, plies that make it up. Wood veneer is anisotropic. There is a very strong dimension, which is parallel to the grain, and there is a weak dimension, which is perpendicular to the grain. And in the veneer models, we were always bending ac uh, across the grain, and uh, the vertical grain was, it, the grain was always vertical and, and weight-bearing in that dimension. Plywood simply couldn't do that. And so we really tried to understand how to solve this problem. We also came to understand that plywood wasn't big enough. You couldn't get a group of people into that thing. You couldn't even get one person into that thing in a protected way. And so we found a material called bendy ply. And bendy ply is a plywood which has a very uh, thin interior core and two thicker outside cores, outside layers. And so it is uh, anisotrop or anisotropic in the same way that, ven that wood veneer is. And what we found was if we uh, made super ply out of the bendy ply, we could aggregate it up to whatever size we wanted. And so we took three layers of bendy ply, no, two layers of bendy ply, uh, which, you, which you see here there is, to make, to lap, so we were lapping it so that we could join it. And sometimes we didn't need to lap it, so we just left it out. And then we made a base and a spine, and we started putting it together in our shop, so in, in many ways solving all of the detailing and design problems uh, on, uh, in, at full scale using this mock-up. And so we worked away at it in our shop, trying to accomplish what we uh, wanted for this, th this uh, element, and you can see it here. So this is uh, the mock-up that we made. Uh, some interesting details where there was too much stress. We cut a slot uh, to relieve that stress. And where the sheets all cut, came together and collapsed by virtue of that, we simply cut them off. And the form popped into this uh, beautiful um, ellipsis. Uh, wherever there was a single layer of um, plywood, we perforated the plywood so that uh, we could differentiate the assembly. And we were careful to uh, fit the base uh, to the layered assembly. We then simply took it apart, uh, laid the pieces flat on the floor, uh, traced the pieces, made uh, CAD drawings of that, uh, shipped those drawings to Winnipeg, uh, and uh, they began fabricating uh, the skating shelters. So here's an example of what the separate pieces look like. We then began studying how to put these together, and so we went back to the veneer models. We found a way to put two together in such a way that they tended to shelter each other. We really wanted to have, uh, and also be different in orientation so that regardless of the direction of the wind, there would always be some of the units that would be out of the wind and some of the units that were shading each other. So this is the final plan of the six. And this is our veneer model 
of what that is, and this is the skating shelters uh, out on the Red River in Winnipeg. Uh, when our photographer, a good friend of, of mine for uh, many, many years, uh, decades, uh, and a good friend of uh, Howard and Bridget's as well, Jimmy Dow, and, and, and David Lieberman, is, who's here tonight as well, uh, came to photograph, it was 35 below. You have to understand that Jimmy is an Ansel Adams trained photographer. And so it's on a tripod and you sit there and you wait for four hours to get the right, perfect light. Well, at 35 below, his discipline went out the window. So uh, uh, this shot was on a tripod, but after that, the tripod was ditched and he was out there uh, shooting uh, sh action shots uh, like the, all of the people that he uh, had always disdained uh, in the past. And so uh, this is uh, a, a hearty group of Winnipeggers uh, skating on the river at 35 below uh, Celsius. Uh, the forms are, uh, are, are really uh, a direct uh, uh, expression of the forces applied to the material. They're really not designed curves. These curves all come out of the force and material, not out of some preconceived idea of what the force might be. Even the stools inside are fabricated in exactly the same way. Uh, and here you see the ellipsis again out in the snow. And then uh, toward the end of the day, uh, the temperature drops to minus 40 degrees. And Jimmy needs his tripod again because he's going to do the, the, <coughs> the glory shot, the, the nighttime shot, which he does. Uh, uh, and I think he uh, had to take a very long hot bath uh, after this. But uh, it was uh, a tremendous experience for us uh, in working directly with wood. Uh, we were just, <coughs> you know, it's really interesting the history or the discipline of architecture primarily is the organization of program in space and in form to which materials are applied. And so you develop a programmatic organization, uh, sp a spatial character, and then you figure out, well, what, how can I build this? And I can frame this with this material or that material, and I can clad it in such and such a way. Uh, here we were working in exactly the opposite manner. We were working with the material, and the limits of the material were what d was describing the form, not the form was, was describing the nature of the material. And so it, it, it's actually very contrary to normal architectural practice. One of the things, though, that we realized was that if we wanted to take this lesson and apply it to a larger scale, we needed to figure out a few things. Uh, and uh, between this project and the next wood project, which I'm going to show you, we did quite a number of steel projects and we came to e be even more knowledgeable about the uh, implication of taking forms or, or materials and applying forces and, and either folding them or bending them to create uh, structural and spatial forms. But we realized that we were always going to be limited by the panel size. Uh, and if we couldn't find a way to get bigger, we would never be able to apply that to architecture. And so the next project, which is a concrete project, but a concrete project made from a wooden form. And I think there's, that was an interesting comment about the, uh, the Swiss bridge earlier, that the form of the bridge was more a function of the wood forming than this concrete uh, uh, re re resulting structure. In this case, uh, this uh, was a, a sort of a speculative project. And the idea was that we would um, cut the land where it was impassable because of topography and vegetation, uh, and construct uh, two retaining walls to make a space. And so this is the cut through the site, and this is it in plan. And the notion is that the retaining walls are undulating to increase their structural performance. And so at the base, they undulate at a much greater period, or more frequent period, than at the top which is this big sweeping arch. And so they trans, trans, transpose, what do they do? They, they transit from this geometry to this geometry 
through their, through what is a ruled surface. And the idea is that if you can take a sheet of material, which is this, and you can twist it and get this form, so this is literally what we call a morphological operation. It's a, we take a material and we put, apply a force and we create a form. You can replicate that characteristic and create a structural and spatial form by what we call a relational operation. And so here we take a series of pieces of wood and we organize them relative to each other to create a similar kind of shape. And the idea of the formwork was that we would create a series of vertical sort of trusses onto which we would add some guide rails and then simply apply two by fours. And these two by fours would be fit to the guide rails. They would be, uh, and as a consequence, they were all straight. So, oop, I'm gonna go back here. So each of these is a straight piece of wood and they simply slide relative to one another to create these curving forms. And then when you, after you shotcrete them and you remove them from the interior, or if you're Peter Sumthor, you burn them from the interior, you get this. You get this undulating concrete form which is constructed out of straight pieces of wood. And therefore, you have a mechanism for deforming a material, in this case, concrete, to create a structural form and spatial form that is reflective of the, the forces which are applied to the concrete through the earth uh, that uh, they are now restraining. And then uh, there was an ideas competition for a library in Daegu in South Korea that uh, came along and we decided that it would be, uh, we would use it as a vehicle to try and understand how to take the formwork from the uh, speculative project and design a building. And so the idea is that you can take boards and, in and dimensional lumber that are of conventional sizes and you can organize them in such a way that they are creating a shell structure. And so here you have 14 foot long three by 12s that are joined as a reciprocal structure that have been shaped relative to one another to create this shell, sh shell structure. And so, and this is a, a concept model. So you have just the individual pieces of wood that are moved relative to one another that are tied together to form a rigid shell. And so there are limits though. So you be, if you begin to study, you think, you see that there are increasing curvatures that you can contemplate. However, with this system, at some point, the members lose meaningful contact with one another. And at that point, the system breaks down. And so geometrically, there is a limit. And so you cannot do this. You cannot do this, but you can do that. And over a large scale, that can result in a significant curvature. And so these represent things you can't do. And this represents something you can do. So this is a model that we constructed in our shop of this structure. Uh, and it's made up of uh, the members that I've described, which are tied together every seven feet. And all told, they create this swelling uh, structure. It's not a, a pure wood structure because there's a, a deck put on this and a concrete topping which acts as a diaphragm. But this is the source of the form and it is the backbone of the form. And so here you see uh, that structure and even where you want to create openings in it, you simply pull the base apart, whereas you leave the top of the wall all tied together and you create gill-like openings uh, in the side of the building. And so uh, this is, it's very basket-like uh, in character. And so this is the plan and so this is where those gills have been opened to get aperture. Uh, this is the entrance to the building and it has a conventional uh, library program with stacks and reading areas and, 
and computer areas and children's library. And the interesting thing about it is that the sections are absolutely uh, illustrative of the operation that's going on here because the cross section, which you see here, is made entirely of the straight pieces of lumber that have gone to make this form or this cross section, again, the same thing. But the long section looks like this. The long section has been cut through all of these subtly adjusting pieces of wood. And so you get this, these remarkable curvatures and spaces, which are the outcome simply of that incremental adjustment of the relative position of the pieces of adjacent wood, which not only create this form, but create a remarkable shell structure. And so the interior has this quality, and uh, it uh, <coughs> is, uh, is something that we, we thought, well, now we're really operating at, a, at an architectural scale where we have a mechanism uh, with which to do this. Unfortunately, this, is a, this was a, an ideas competition which uh, didn't result in a, in a building for us, but we were then uh, contacted by uh, a yoga ashram in Kootenai Bay. Kootenai Bay is in southeastern British Columbia. It's a very remote place. Uh, it's, um, it's a long, it's, it's equally equidistant from Calgary and Vancouver. So it's about as far away as you can get from an urban center as possible. Uh, and selected for obvious reasons by the ashram. Uh, and they, um, uh, had an interesting history. They were founded in the 1960s, in the late 60s, as you might expect, uh, by a German expat, a woman who uh, had been to India and had returned uh, to Canada after that experience and to British Columbia and uh, decided to create an ashram. And so there she is uh, in, uh, in, the, in the late 60s, um, the, they, the, it's actually quite a significant community now and has uh, a large number of buildings and some uh, agricultural land. Uh, and the uh, temple was uh, as a 30 minutes, no problem. Um, uh, the temple was uh, an important part of their objective. And so they began constructing a temple in 1990. Oop, I'm going to go back to 1990, which you see here. And in uh, 2014, I think, it burned. There was a, there was a uh, tradesman, I think he was soldering some uh, eaves troughing or something. There was some piece of work that he was doing and the building caught fire and burned and was destroyed. And so they constructed uh, a polyethylene temporary temple, which I think is a remarkably beautiful, elegant structure. Uh, Wish we could have done that, but we didn't. Uh, but we were commissioned to replace uh, the uh, temple with a building that would be uh, extremely high performance. This, this was a net zero community. Uh, they, uh, they were absolutely committed to sustainability and they wanted a building that was high performance but very evocative in character. Not only that, they required that we reuse the foundation of the existing building. And the existing building was uh, an octagonal drum with a vaulted, with a dome on top. And the eight-sided figure was uh, symbolic of uh, what they understood to be the eight major religions of the world, uh, and who were all welcome. And each, of the, each face of the building was, uh, had a door. And so uh, our, we were required to uh, rep replicate the eight-sided figure that would sit on the foundation of the uh, existing building. And so we developed a plan, and this is, uh, these are the eight bearing points of the original building, which is where our structure is located, as well as a, an auxiliary building, which houses uh, some support spaces and, and the entrance to the building. And so, just to give you uh, an overview, you can see that the building has a fluid geometry. It has um, uh, uh, 
some primary uh, structural embers, which you can see here. Uh, I'll explain in detail what they are in a moment. Uh, and uh, is divided into eight uh, what we called petals. And one other thing you might notice, note about this community is that it's a matri matriarchal society. It's uh, all of the leaders of the community are women. It was founded by a woman, and they're, uh, they, I don't know that it's, it's required, but it's certainly been their tradition to always be uh, led by women. And so uh, the uh, desire for a building that somehow uh, expressed that quality, uh, the original temple had been a very sort of stolid, classical dome space, uh, very uh, sort of primary geometry. And so we wanted to find a way to have a geometry that was quite different than that, something that was much more fluid and lyrical and delicate in character. And to do that, we developed uh, uh, this figure uh, of uh, a petal, which you can see in part. This is almost a complete one, which you see here, which is simply because it has to bear on the eight symmetrical uh, bearing points, simply rotates around that point. It's also uh, repeated for economy reasons. So this is what that is. And it's made just like the uh, library that I just showed you and the formwork that I showed you before, primarily of straight pieces of wood. And so this is a ruled surface. So each of these faces, and maybe you can see, I think when you get around this pedal, you can begin to see, this is a poor quality digital print, but you can see all these lines. And those lines are actually the ruled surface, the, the straight pieces of wood that will ultimately be what we use to make this. And so uh, it's uh, an array, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit more sophisticated than the previous uh, two uh, examples where the uh, ruled elements were parallel to one another. Here they're slightly arrayed so that they're opening out. And so they, they, there's a bit of a fan shape to their disposition. And so the, the idea is that you construct eight arches and those arches started out to be a pair of arches, uh, which ultimately for cost reasons became consolidated into one arch. But what you have is an interior edge, which is a simple curve, and an exterior edge which undulates, or I guess this dark line is the best example, and this is the dark one here is the interior, and this one is the exterior. And then you attach a piece of straight piece of wood to the interior edge and the exterior edge, which causes those pieces of wood to wave around. And that creates the undulating character of the surface, and then you trim those straight pieces of wood on a curved line, and so when you see the result, you believe that you're looking at a very complex doubly curved surface, when in reality, you're looking at a ruled surface. And so occasionally, we, or not occasionally, and every one we trimmed the lower por portion out to construct a window. Uh, and as a consequence, the intersection of this cut line with our ruled surface results in a couple more curved members. So the only curved members in the scheme are the primary arch and a secondary curved member which frames the window. Everything else is made up of straight pieces. And so here you can see the straight pieces of wood and the plywood diaphragm which is applied to them to create the shell. And the diaphragm is, is a very hard working component of the building. You'll see construction shots in a moment and you may notice how light the, frame, the structure is. The shell itself is remarkably structurally uh, competent by virtue of the plywood diaphragm and the curvilinear form. And so here you see the arch and the, we added this upper wood framing to create more undulation and a steel uh, element to uh, construct the portal for the door, the eight doors which are required. And then within the interior, we have a catenary suspended, um, uh, it's an acoustic chandelier. It, it provides lighting, but also acoustic absorption into the interior. And this is the assembly. The, it's, uh, the, the building is um, 
I, I think it's about R40 uh, as a uh, the wall uh, assembly thickness. It's uh, uh, triple glazed. Uh, it uh, has a geothermal uh, uh, energy source, so it's extremely uh, high performing building. And here you can see, so we have this additional curved member which comes about as the cut that we made through the ruled surface. So this is how it goes together. So we made a jig, and the jig is interesting because as the members rotate, they can't go into a jig and then when they become wet wedded to each other, come out. So the jig has to break down uh, after you've assembled the piece. And, we, and for obviously for economy reasons, we made eight of these uh, out of one jig. And so here are, is how it starts to go together. This is the lowest part of the pedal. And so here you see that curved piece that we had to bring in as a result of the cut that we made. We worked with uh, RDH, the building envelope people, and they were very difficult for us because we were always under enormous pressure cost-wise, and they kept saying, no, you can't get away with that. And ultimately, uh, we found many, many sort of smart ways to eliminate layers of construction and still maintain uh, a high-performance envelope. And here in the venting, we used drainage mat between structural members to cause deformation in the air barrier uh, to allow air to move across as well as the strapping that allows it to move up. So we were able to take an entire layer of construction out of the, out of the uh, building envelope simply by inserting these uh, drainage uh, mat uh, components. And the di structural diaphragm that comes on the pieces as uh, uh, fabricated uh, waiting to be coated, which they were coated with a liquid applied membrane in the plant. And I should say that this uh, was done in a shop in Nelson, BC, which is just across the lake from the ashram uh, by a company called Spearhead. And this is a remarkable coincidence because Spearhead uh, works globally, providing very high sophisticated digital fabricated components through the Middle East, through the United States, and they just happen to be located within uh, 20 kilometers of our building site. And without them, I don't think we would have been able to accomplish this. And interesting though, for a plant that is very, very uh, sophisticated in terms of its technology, when it came to uh, creating this bevel in the base of the primary arch, uh, the easiest way to do it was simply to cut, use the CNC to cut slots and then to chisel it out. Uh, and that's really interesting that they, even though they were so heavily committed to CNC fabrication, they were not resistant to using traditional techniques when they were more effective. So here are the basic frames on site. You can see the thing being put together. We had a rough winter that year and that slowed us down. Uh, here you can see the primary arches, so the undulating upper and the smooth inner, and the first of the components uh, going in. So it's built like an igloo. The pieces just stack one on top of the other. And you can see that uh, the, uh, we did, the upper portions were finished, the lower portions which were accessible from the site were done later. But you can see that we're beginning to get a space and a form that belies the uh, origin of all these straight members. And so here you have the structure which are spanning in this direction, and the blocking, which is doing a lot to carry some gravity forces down, but ultimately all wel welded together by the plywood diaphragm. And each of these pieces was uh, unique and uh, was developed through very detailed uh, collaboration between 
our digital modeling and the in-house uh, spearhead digital modeling. The construction cost of this project was $3 million. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it shows how cost-effective wood construction can be. If it were in any other material, it would have been enormously more expensive. And so here is the final building. Again, these are ruled surfaces. They are not curving in two directions. They are simply uh, an array of straight members which have been trimmed in a curve. Moving into the interior. We were very concerned about acoustics because we had a, an acoustic consultant who assured us that a dome-like form would, was the worst possible form that you can have uh, uh, for any assembly occupancy because it would focus all the reflection into a single point. And he assured us that we had a re re reverberation time between three and four seconds and it would be an impossible space. And it's interesting because uh, it didn't transpire to be the case. As a consequence of that, we were very concerned about um, the acoustics and we introduced these absorbers, but which you see here, these are, are foam, uh, four foot long foam uh, uh, cylinders. Uh, but what we um, came to understand uh, in our uh, sort of anal our own analysis was by virtue of the fact that this is not a, a dome, it's actually each pedal has a s different geometry. The glass has been tipped outward, so it's actually pointing upward, so that uh, all of the possible points of convergence are scattered. Uh, and the result is that it's been a tremendously successful venue for performance. And so uh, it's now the go-to place in that part of British Columbia for music and dance and all kinds of uh, uh, singing, uh, and the acoustics are working out tremendously well, uh, which is it's very disconcerting because we rely on those uh, uh, consultants all the time, and we make important big deci decisions based on their advice. And <laughs> it so happens that uh, in this case, uh, the, pro the object was actually more subtle and more sort of sophisticated than the simple concept of a dome-like space uh, would support. Okay, so the last project I'm gonna show is uh, uh, what's called the Academic Tower. I'm sure at some point in its future it'll be some called something else, but for the moment uh, it's called the Academic Tower and we're doing this together with MJMA uh, in uh, Toronto, uh, who we've partnered with on other uh, projects in the past, including the Goldring Center for High Performance Sport, which is this building. Uh, and um, the, the wood tower, so this is, uh, a, uh, will be, when constructed, we understand the tallest wood structure in North America. Uh, it's, uh, uh, hopefully, we'll, it will be constructed and hopefully ahead of the next taller one, which is undoubtedly around the corner. Um, but it has a very uh, interesting history, which begins with the Goldring Center for High Performance Sport. This was a competition which uh, we entered in 2009 uh, and which we won. And I should uh, also acknowledge uh, both for this as well as the tower, uh, the brilliant uh, work of Blackwell engineers and Dave Volk, who have been unbelievable uh, collaborators. But the, uh, the Goldring Center for High Performance Sport was a, a super challenging project because um, it was a complex project on a tight site that required a competition uh, uh, standard uh, basketball and volleyball court, as well as a, a large fitness facility and research spaces. And one of the things that we came to understand uh, very quickly after beginning the competition was 
you can't fit a competition <coughs> standard basketball and volleyball court on the site. The site which is from here to here and the setbacks which push the building back to here are wider than required for uh, the uh, basketball venue. And so we had to push the building, the basketball venue below ground uh, to allow it to stick into the side yards. Well, we're, we're in good shape. Um, to stick into the side yards and because of that, we couldn't have any columns uh, going uh, into, obviously columns don't work very well in the middle of a basketball court and they're not even appreciated in the middle of the, uh, 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 the audience uh, seating area. And so what we did was we constructed a bridge structure that spans the long way across the site. And so these are all multi-story trusses from which this building is suspended. And you can see the building under construction here. So the central trusses are a very, very deep upper story and the perimeter trusses are multi-story, which you can see here on the uh, Devonshire side of the site. And this remarkable photograph, which you see here, which is of the structure of the building hung from the superstructure above the basketball venue. So here is the entire building just floating above you uh, in this space. Well, <clears throat> this was a challenge, uh, but it wasn't the only challenge on this project because uh, the site was also not big enough in the long dimension. And so when we were able to get the building onto the site by virtue of putting the basketball venue below ground, we, the building came to here. And we were also required to allow for a future tower, which is part of the master plan. The future tower was bigger than the remaining portion of the site. Not only that, our, which you can see in this image, so here is, oop, here is the, the tower, and this is the remaining portion of the site, and there is no servicing for Woodsworth, Woodsworth College, residences, Goldring Center, or the Monk School, uh, and so, the only solution, we couldn't get a truck in and get it out we could, to service any of these buildings. So what we had to do was to develop a turntable large enough to turn a large garbage truck and to organize four, our four required uh, service bays and materials handling all within a footprint in the remaining portion of the site which you see here and we had to do that to facilitate the construction of the Goldring Center and anticipate that there would be a tower, a high-rise building built on top of all of this at the same time. And so that was a real puzzle because the tower that was to be placed on top of this was bigger than any of its components. Not only that, the core, the north core of Goldring which would ultimately have to become the core of the tower, was very generous in its proportion in uh, east-west basis, but was extremely weak in its north-south axis. And so that posed an enormous structural question. And we had no ability to create an entrance to the tower because the, ground, the floor plate was completely uh, filled. And so we proposed that we would double up the north core of Goldring, which served the uh, upper research portions of the building with the future tower. And so we ended up with uh, a, a building, a future building that would occupy this site, one bay of services for the entire block, a very, very slender interior bay for the core, and then a perimeter bay for the lobby, but the structure of Goldring was designed so that there could be no loads added. So this portion of the tower had to be cantilevered over the Goldring building without bearing any load on it. And so um, uh, the building was designed to have, this is the, uh, the second level, I think, yeah. Uh, level two, yes. Uh, and so here you see a connection 
from Monk into this, uh, this area. Going up the building, we have begin to have some classrooms. The notion at the time was that we would have nothing but offices on the floors above, so that was uh, a fairly uh, easy to accommodate program type. It's transpired that we now have quite a number of classrooms. We have a large venue, event venue. We've got all manner of large span, deep floor uh, components, which have in continued to add complexity. We have a large meeting venue on the fourth floor, which has access to roof of the Golding Center to the south, and then our tower. And because of the extremely modest dimension of the core in this direction, the lateral structure of the uh, tower is, is achieved by having uh, d the skin of the building being a diaphragm, so it's a tube. Uh, it's a tube framed by at that time of the, uh, the initial design uh, steel uh, structure. So here you have it. Uh, and then in, I think, three years ago, uh, we were asked uh, a very interesting question. Could you make this tower in wood? It had been, des you, if you can put a basketball venue on a site that's smaller than the basketball venue, if you can put, uh, if you can put a, a, a truck turntable uh, that services the entire block uh, below a future uh, high-rise tower, why can't you do it in wood? And so we said, okay, and, and in this regard, it, the, the credit goes to uh, Blackwell, obviously, because it's more of a structural question than an architectural one. And they went away and they did a study and they came back <laughs> with uh, a positive response. They said, yes, um, uh, steel and wood have many similarities and many sort of structural uh, uh, strategies that they share in common, even though they have different material performance. Uh, and it is possible that we could do this in wood. In fact, there are a number of ways in which it can be done. And this drawing shows in three concepts. One is that it would be an entirely wood frame building, including the core. Um, the next idea is that there would be a steel core. <clears throat> steel, of course, it has fire issues as wood does. It doesn't have the inherent fire resistance that wood has. So when wood chars and becomes sort of uh, insulated from fire, Steel doesn't. Once the fire uh, gets into the steel, the temperature causes the steel to collapse. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the problem with the co the, this composite structure is that you have two trades on site uh, constructing the building, and you have two materials which actually uh, behave differently over time. And so it was uh, an option that we didn't recommend. And the third is that you construct the lower portion of the building in steel, in this case, and the upper portion in wood. We have a building in Vancouver right now, which is a concrete building, which has a six-story timber uh, top, uh, which uses that uh, mixed structure uh, composite idea. And so this is an image of uh, the uh, existing building, or the existing foundation that we constructed. This shows the idea of maximum wood, where the core, which is sort of hidden in this structure, is wood-framed as well. Uh, the existing structure that we constructed, obviously, was steel, because we anticipated the building being a steel building. Uh, or if you go to the idea of a steel core, you can see how the steel would run through the building and the remainder would be wood. And if you go to the idea of the stack structure, the lower portion could be steel, and then the upper portion could be wood. We recommended, and the university has accepted the maximum wood uh, strategy, which uh, we're delighted about. Another really interesting thing about this building, and this this is from the original study, we looked at the obviously the the perimeter of the building is an important part of the lateral stability of the building because of the small core. 
And so uh, we looked at how to make that act as a tube. And so we examined op uh, options. The first option is steel lateral framing. And lateral framing in steel could be left exposed, and it could be a very elegant solution. Uh, but we decided that we really didn't want to have a, that kind of a hybrid. We preferred to be all wood. However, if you go to all wood and you do what's necessary in that same framing uh, mode, the size of the wood members falls below the minimum size required to have a self-protecting wood member. We, the minimum size of an exposed wood member, and, and our intention is that uh, except for uh, the core, all of the wood framing will be exposed to the interior of the building. So you will, in moving through the building, see the wood structure, unlike other structures such as Brock, Brock Commons in Vancouver, which is entirely clad and none of the wood structure is, is visible. And so here uh, you, you have the problem, though, that the uh, lateral uh, framing is, falls below the minimum size. So we moved to the idea of a super brace and consolidated all the lateral forces into much larger members, which then conveniently just hit the 400 by 400 size. And so now the lateral framing can be exposed uh, wood. And so this is uh, an image of the tower as seen from Bloor Street. Uh, uh, it will, as I say, it's the uh, will be the tallest wood structure in North America. This is a large uh, venue space at the top of the building. There are a number of big classrooms on various floors within the building. Uh, this is a view of it from uh, the southeast, uh, looking across Varsity Field. This is a view for looking from Varsity Field. Uh, it's clad in um, fiber cement, uh, which uh, we're uh, trying to find the right uh, character uh, to be clearly uh, uh, an appropriate cladding, but also something that speaks of the uh, wood uh, structure. There is uh, some additional interesting spaces, very eccentric spaces, such as this stair, which comes up from the existing lobby and wraps around and goes back into the tower, which will have some extremely large uh, members, which you can just see here, which are actually not portrayed at the right size, uh, which are part of that uh, lateral uh, framing. A view from above, from Bloor Street, a view from uh, St. George, uh, which is a very important view for the, fa for the uh, Rotman School, which is one of the prime tenants uh, of this building, or one of, will be one of the prime tenants of this building. Some of the uh, interiors where you see the uh, wood structure, uh, which is exposed, and the event space at the top of the building, which uh, has a 270 degree view looking uh, in this direction, we're looking west, north, and behind us, we're looking east back to uh, the city. And finally, uh, another look at the building. And so uh, I have beat my time limit, and uh, I would be very pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That's uh, that just uh, so amazing, mind blowing. I, um, when John submitted his title of the lecture um, for us here at Would It Work, Would It Work and Play, we were so blown away because we thought that is the, the best possible title for a lecture, and that was just astounding. So I just I'm going to bring the mic around, um, open the floor up for questions. Is there? There's two mics, so whoever's closest. I've got a lot of questions, okay. so you guys okay. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and your passion for architecture. Uh, and we know the design of the nature is a very fundamental role in your uh, architecture process. Uh, and we know that in the 
light of the temple, you using organic form by applying the wood material to the very complex uh, roof surface, and you also inviting the daylighting and uh, sustainable strat strategies into the wood building. So my question comes, is there any reason or motivation or personal experience that keep you always designed with the nature? Well, we don't always design with nature. <laughs> we, we certainly, um, uh, we, we've done large urban buildings. Uh, I think Bridget uh, mentioned the Columbia Tech in Montreal, and we've got the Gold Ring Center, which is a large urban building. Uh, so I don't think we always work with nature, but we, we, every time we have an opportunity to think about nature and respond to nature, uh, it's uh, uh, sort of our happy place. In fact, we uh, moved to British Columbia because of a desire to have a strong uh, natural context to work within. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's something that we craved uh, from the outset as, our, as young architects, and it's, I think it's something that uh, the whole conference that we've had uh, in the last uh, day and a half uh, has suggested as being the future of cities. I really think that uh, uh, bringing nature back into the city is an important part, and w there's been lots of discussion about urban forestry, about the forest within the city, about uh, the need for uh, the canopy of the forest in the city. And so uh, I think it is a fundamental uh, uh, congenial uh, environment for a living organism. Uh, it's something that uh, I certainly always uh, appreciate, uh, and I suspect that that's uh, very widespread, and, uh, and, and that's why I think that, uh, that's another reason why I think the movement toward wood as a large and expressed uh, element in building construction is uh, has so much momentum because I think there is such a widespread uh, appreciation of its natural qualities within uh, the entire uh, sort of uh, uh, human population. I think it's uh, it's extremely wide, uh, widely appreciated. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment about the regulatory thing you're, uh, right now we're limited to six stories in wood and I mean, it forced, I think uh, BC is allowing 12, and so I wonder if you have any insight about that for Ontario. Um, I don't have much insight. I know that, uh, and, and in this regard, uh, I really need uh, uh, Ted Watson or Leland Datsun from MJMA to uh, s jump up because they're the ones who are leading the uh, discussions with uh, the uh, building authorities in Toronto. Uh, but uh, we've received uh, to date very positive uh, response, uh, a real desire on the part of uh, the building authorities to find a way to make it work. Uh, and so it's been very collaborative. Uh, I think there is, as, uh, as uh, part of the answer to the previous question, I think there is a, a very general and profound desire on the part of most people to find a way to bring this material into broader use within cities. Uh, John, just over here. Uh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> there we are. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Very interesting the way you kind of started it off, kind of just small, and uh, with the, to me, kind of that culmination with a, you know, a kind of pretty serious, massive uh, timber project at uh, the Goldring Center. And uh, by the way, I love the Goldring Center. I mean, I know there's a lot of concrete there and steel, but it's just a fantastic project. Um, so with, uh, with the project that you've described and uh, looking at what Google and Sidewalk Labs have in mind uh, for the Toronto waterfront, uh, those are, you know, I mean, pretty serious undertakings. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is around 
you know, do we have the capacity in this country right now to supply that? Where do you see the supply chain for that type of uh, material and the, uh, and the uh, amount of those materials? Uh, where are we at in this country with regards to that? I mean, are we biting off more that we can chew? Can we supply right now? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a good question. Um, certainly, it, uh, I think all of the uh, industries that have been established to create mass timber will be nothing but busy uh, in the future. I think the, the, there is nothing but upside for them. Um, we're doing a CLT, a large CLT house in Vancouver, in Whistler right now, and, and that CLT was a bid to Canadian suppliers, but it was an Austrian company that got the job. Uh, I suspect that uh, there will be a lot of European CLT, and, and maybe in the future uh, a lot of uh, Chinese CLT that might come to North America, although I'm sure the Chinese market is so large that they can absorb whatever they can make. Uh, but uh, uh, so I think there will be uh, a problem of supply in the short term. I think that uh, all of the companies that are pioneers in that, all the Canadian companies that are pioneers in mass timber uh, will have be pushed to the limit in terms of their capacity to uh, in grow. Um, uh, and I think that... Um, in the, in the end, I, I, unfortunately, my plane was delayed yesterday and I didn't get to see Michael Green's presentation, but um, I think that there are initiatives uh, such as the uh, Cantera initiative that he's uh, a part of that may be uh, the way of capitalizing uh, increased capacity. Uh, it will require a, a remarkable amount of capitalization to do that. And so, but I think once the material is proved, uh, there, will, there will be lots of people who want to uh, get in on it. So it, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I, I think that, it, that uh, everything will, it will blossom in a remarkably short period of time. Hi, John. Thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. I really appreciated the, um, the last part of with the academic tower and how you show different options of using different building materials. Uh, and I just want to know, is it, would you, when you approach a project, would you consider wood as the first primary material to meet your client's needs and also your design philosophy? Or are you open to other materials just as you are open to the number, the types of different types of projects that you partake in. Mm -hmm. Well, many projects are driven by cost uh, to a large measure. Uh, and in that regard, uh, materials are typically selected, uh, and this is a widespread, not me, it's, a, it's widespread within the profession. Materials are selected because they can do the job for the least money. Uh, and it requires some wiggle room, uh, although you can be creative about creating that wiggle room, uh, in order to uh, sometimes to use uh, an alternate material than the most instrumental material available. Uh, in British Columbia, uh, wood is, uh, is readily available. It's, uh, it's, it's the go-to material for small-scale construction, certainly. Um, it's, uh, it's the, it's, it's certainly, uh, from, it, it doesn't have the barrier of cost that it might have in other places, although I don't, I really don't know the economy of small scale construction in other parts of Canada. Um, but when you get to large scale construction, currently uh, wood is a, is a premium and you need to have a client who is prepared, who wants wood and is prepared to pay that premium. Uh, I don't know that that will remain. I think that, uh, again, it's a question of, of capacity. Uh, once the uh, Canadian wood industry is, is geared up, it might be that they are very competitive with uh, concrete and steel. That remains to be seen. At the moment, uh, it's, you, you need a, somebody who really wants to do a wood structure.
a, a large wood structure. Any more questions? Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation and for the generosity of sharing all of the technical way that you achieve your beautiful projects. Um, my question is, um, can you tell us a bit about the culture in your office that allows you to pursue the kind of projects that you do and like where, I mean, what, what's it like to work in your office? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it, it's, it's an office filled with very serious people. Uh, it, people call it the monastery because uh, nobody, nobody speaks. It's, it's completely still and quiet. Everybody's so busy working. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, a, it's a small office. We have a total of 19 people in the office. Um, I would say half of that number has been a team for over a decade, and the, the core group of, of uh, leaders in the office have been together for more than uh, uh, a couple of decades. So it's a very, very sort of tight uh, team which has very um, close communication. It's, uh, it's very, uh, in a sense, it's all out there. It's a, a simple, big studio space. There are no private offices. There, everything, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, is uh, open to everybody. Um, it is, um, we, are, we have a culture where we never ask anybody not to do better. We never say it's good enough. We never say you've run out of time. If they can make it better, uh, we encourage them to make it better regardless of uh, the implications of that. Um, we have an active um, research uh, initiative within the office which uh, is largely unremunerated and when it is remunerated, it's not remunerated uh, proportional to the effort. Uh, and so uh, it's a, economically, it's a disaster. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, the, everybody has a bit of a cut in what they, certainly everybody in the office could be doing much better financially somewhere else, uh, but they're there because they enjoy doing, working on the projects. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's bizarre because we've been in Vancouver for 35 years or now as an office, and uh, we, until uh, a couple of years ago, uh, with the exception of the University of British Columbia, we've never been hired by a, a British Columbia client. Uh, every, virtually every project, uh, that's an exaggeration, but virtually every project that we've had is somebody, all the house projects that we've done have been somebody who have relocated from someplace in the east to BC. Not, we've, we have not done a house for a BC client. Um, now that we've completed two uh, public projects that have gotten a lot of public response, the Odain Museum and the Polygon Gallery, suddenly uh, we are known. Uh, and until those two projects were done, uh, we were completely unknown to uh, Vancouver uh, community. Uh, partly because Pat and I are extremely introverted and uh, our favorite thing is to go home. Uh, and, and stay home. Uh, we don't socialize. We, we don't interact with uh, anybody outside of our office. Uh, and so we're uh, born failures. Uh, <laughs> and only through persistence have we avoided that. Um, so it's, it's a strange place, and it's, but it's, the, part of the strangeness is suddenly it seems to be changing. Uh, we've gotten Two developers have come and said, we've never been able to get a developer job. Uh, uh, in the last year, we've gotten two developers who've come to us and, uh, looking for something uh, out of the box. So I don't know, maybe uh, in my dotage, it's going to be a completely different thing. And uh, that, be, that could be good. Well, um, if there's, is there a burning question still? Maybe one more? 
Dr. Burning question is the right uh, metaphor for this <laughs> conference. So my question is pretty um, particular to the first two projects relating to school design. And did you see an impact relating back to the material that you were using with the psychological and mental development of kids? Yeah, <clears throat> very much so. The first school for the indigenous community was we chose materials that were part of, with the exception of the fact that we use Paralam, uh, that were part of their uh, tradition. So uh, uh, local wood structure and uh, cedar uh, shingle cladding. Uh, with the Strawberry Vale School, which was a public school, uh, we were very uh, 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 clear that we selected uh, small scale pieces of wood, stud framing and uh, b dimensional lumber basically as the primary uh, construction component of the building for environmental reasons because that was the most readily available, cheapest and most appropriate uh, building technology available to us. So yes, in both cases for different reasons, uh, wood was the material that we chose for very um, important, what we thought were very important reasons. John, not so much a question, but thank you for the pleasure of your buildings. Uh, thank you for going back four decades, because I thought 10 years before what was shown of sharing the intimacy of those conversations with you and Pat, for the articulate way in which you draw, often in section, the section of landscape, the section of the constructed landscape of the city, uh, understanding the thickness of surface, the nature of materials, and whether it's wood, whether it's concrete, whether it's steel, delivering uh, with a remarkable, articulate, edited palette, beautiful poetry. So thank you, my friend. Thank you, David. And thank you, David. That's a great segue to a thank you from Wood at Work for capping off um, this conference with such an amazing display of, of beauty and of creativity and ingenuity. The, one of the questions that was um, uh, circulating during our conference was how do, how do architects show up to participate in the transformation of um, the, way we, the way we build and the way we think about materials? And um, your work is such a perfect example of how architects can do that. Um, the, the poetry that draws people in at whatever level of technical understanding they have to just see something that can change, um, change their mind and, and lift them up. So I, w I just want to thank you for work that does that. I've been looking forward to this lecture for a long time in and it far exceeded my expectations just to sit there and see this beautiful work. So thank you so much, David, uh, John. Um, and we have a reception um, waiting for everyone um, outside. So I'd just like to welcome everyone to come and chat with John and, and each other. Um, and thank you. And thank you to the, uh, to the Daniels faculty again for hosting us. Thank you very much.